Thank you, everybody, and welcome to the Lowy Institute in Sydney for what is, I think, our third in-person event for 2021 and a very welcome change from, from most of 2020 when we were all online. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Oliver and I'm the Director of Research at the Lowy Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay respects to our, their elders past and present and emerging. I would also like to welcome our distinguished guests today, members of the Sydney Consular Corps, including the Consuls General of Japan, France and Switzerland, senior diplomats from the United Kingdom, Ireland and Fiji, and especially to our wonderful Supporter Circle members who supported us so bravely throughout a very difficult 2020. It's really great to see you back here again today. We're very pleased to have been able to extend the capacity of our, um, our in-person events here at the Institute. Um, it's still a little bit distanced and very healthy. But for those of you who weren't able to join us today in person for what has proved to be a very hot ticket event, <laughs> almost as hot as a, 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 a ticket for Hamilton but a little less pricey. <laughs> um, welcome to you all who are watching online um, or listening by podcast as well. Tickets did actually sell out almost immediately for this event. And for that, all credit goes to our guests on the stage oh. today. We originally scheduled this event for March last year, and of course we had to cancel it. And we're now very pleased today to finally be hosting the two of you. Um, and please welcome to the stage these highly credentialed ri rising stars in Australian oh. politics. Uh, Peter Khalil, the member for Wills in Victoria, and Dave Sharma, member for Wentworth um, in here in Sydney. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Now, on paper, although they've found themselves on different sides of politics, there are many similarities to their backgrounds. Both have distinguished themselves in careers before coming to Parliament. They've both worked in government, uh, Peter and David both at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Peter at Defence and Dave at Prime Minister and Cabinet. Peter's worked at the SBS and been a Victorian Multicultural Commissioner. Both have worked for the Australian Government abroad. Peter has served in Iraq um, in defence and with DFAT. Dave has been a career diplomat, posted to Papua New Guinea for several years, worked in Washington DC after 9-11 and was appointed ambassador to Israel by uh, Prime Minister, uh, Foreign Minister Bob Carr in 2013. Both have worked as ministerial and prime ministerial advisors. Peter for Kevin Rudd and Joel Fitzgibbon and Dave for Alexander Downer and Julia Gillard, so nicely bipartisan on stage here, and both have law degrees, which makes three refugees from the law here on stage to, <laughs> on the stage today, as my former boss Alan Ginger would like to stay to say. Neither are shrinking violets, so the gloves are coming off today. Um, Peter has made public interventions on matters as diverse as racism at Collingwood amnesties for Myanmar students in Australia, government funding for the arts and Paul Keating's sartorial style. Dave Sharma has made interventions on uh, Netanyahu's election prospects, gender targets and representation in Parliament. Talking with Alan Jones on Sky News about Myanmar and describing himself as a modern liberal in the 2019 election, perhaps to the surprise of his own party. Just a brief uh, disclosure, I'm proud to call Lydia Khalil my colleague at the Lowy Institute. She's a, a senior research fellow here. She happens to be married to Peter Khalil, uh, making them one of Australia's policy power couples. <laughs> now, I know you've all been looking forward to this conversation as much as we have, so let's uh, let the battle begin, take the gloves off. Um, and just before we do that, boys, um, we, we will devote about 20 minutes at the end of this session to questions and answers, so please get your questions ready because that's often the most interesting part of the proceedings. So this, uh, this battle was billed as Australia's place in the world. Um, not necessarily a battle, but it is a big strategic question and I want to ask both of you first, what is Australia's place in the world now? Um, we are no doubt in challenging uh, international times volatile geopolitics and geostrategics. Um, what sort of foreign policy should Australia have for the next decade as we emerge out of COVID, one of the biggest disruptions in a century? Start with you, Peter. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, uh, Loey, for, for inviting us here today. It's, it's fantastic to be having a debate about foreign policy. And I want to thank Michael Fullove and Alex and everyone at the Lowy Institute for making this happen. It's great that you've all come out too for a foreign affairs uh, discussion. Um, we won't say fight. Uh, Dave and I are friends, but when we cross that white line, so to speak, in the foreign policy 
uh, game, uh, the gloves are off. And, and I think that's an important part of our system where we can actually debate issues, um, disagree uh, and, and uh, reason uh, on, our, on our policy objectives and our vision. And this is the question that, that Alex is asking. What is our place in the world? You know, for so long, historically, uh, you know, Australia's been seen as suffering from the tyranny of distance or to put it more pungently, uh, Paul Keating once called us, be, you know, us being at the arse end of the world. Um, that is no longer the case. We are squarely in the centre of what is probably the most uh, volatile and important uh, strategic region for the 21st century. And with that comes a degree of, or a number of great challenges and a number of opportunities as well. And I think um, navigating uh, those challenges, the relationship with China, our economic partnership with China, our, um, our, our strategic and security alliance with the US, being able to maximise both relationships to get the most for Australia, maximise our benefit and our national interest is a huge challenge. It's very, very difficult and the, it's a devilish problem in, in many respects. Uh, but we also have an opportunity uh, as a middle power to, to no longer, I, I hate the phrase, punch above your weight, because we always hear that about Australia. I think it's time for us to recognise uh, Australia's weight as a middle power. We're the 12th largest economy in the world, depending on the, on the stats. Culturally, economically, strategically, we are an important country. And there is a legacy of achievement in foreign policy. You know, going back to Doc Evatt uh, and, and our, our role in multilateral, building up the United Nations and other multilateral architecture and, and the world that we now live in uh, as a result of that. Uh, through to Whitlam and, and the detente with China, through to the, the Hawke-Keating governments and Gareth Evans's efforts, the Canberra Commission and, um, and, and other things like the Cambodia Peace Plan. We have a legacy uh, of and a history of achievement, which I would like to see rise again. I want to see ambition in our foreign affairs, not just reacting to events, not just sitting back and waiting for things to happen, but actually taking a step forward and, and being a participant. Now, that, that uh, it sounds like it's easier said than done, and it is, but there is a history there. It's in our DNA. We can do it. So as far as our place in the world, we need to step up to the challenge now and be able to help be part of the solution around making sure that we continue the stability and prosperity that we've enjoyed. That, that means being able to walk and chew gum at the same time with respect to our major relationships with both China and the US, but also being a participant as a middle power and working with other middle powers to help prop up, I call it a middle power fulcrum, to prop up uh, the international rules-based order which has served us so well. Uh, and those things are starting to happen in different ways. There's the quad and other things, but I think we should be doing a, a hell of a lot more. And my probably my criticism of the current government is that we are not ambitious enough uh, in taking those steps forward and actually being a participant in that respect to secure our place in the world to make sure that Australia continues to have a stable, prosperous, secure environment that benefits us, we need to play a much, much more active role, a much more active role as a middle power. Dave, does Australia lack ambition? No, I don't think so. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go back to the Australia's place in the world, first of all. You mentioned Alan Gingell before, and former director here, and I think he, his, his book, which is sort of a history of Australian foreign policy that came out a few years ago, described Australia as an audacious national project. And I think when you live here and you uh, spend time here, you take everything we've got for granted. But when you just look at how Australia came about, it is quite an audacious national project. Here we are, a nation of 24 million people um, occupying a whole continent. Um, uh, most people... Uh, here, other than our Indigenous people, or everyone here other than our Indigenous people has come from another corner of the world. Um, traditionally in our early history, it was from countries far afield, predominantly from Europe, um, and to establish what was first a colonial outpost and a penal colony, and then to turn it into a, um, you know, one of the largest, you know, 12th largest economy in the world, uh, with one of the highest living standards in the world that's secure, prosperous and harmonious, within really about six generations of people, um, is a pretty remarkable effort. But it's um, none of it was sort of preordained. It's taken taken some um, difficult decisions uh, and some national leadership and foresight along the way to get there. When I think about Australia now and our place in the world, I, I sort of think of three things that have really underpinned where we are today uh, in our national history. The first has been um, for Australia uh, an alliance with the major naval power of the day, 
in, in the years after federation from colonial settlement to, to really the Second World War, that was the United Kingdom, the, the Royal Navy, and then the years after that, that was the United States. Um, the second element, if, if you like, has been um, uh, a rules-based international order. Australia has thrived and prospered under the certainty and stability and predictability that that, um, that, that gives us. Uh, and the third element really has been our what Peter described as the tyranny of distance, which the corollary of that is a huge measure of security by being um, far from sort of competing theatres of the world. And each of those three tenets, if you like, is under some stress. The rules-based international order, because we've got rising powers that no longer accept the legitimacy of it and wish to change it in one way or another. Um, the predominance or the margin of superiority of the United States, as, particularly in our region as a leading maritime power of the day, the United States no longer enjoys the sort of margin of absolute supremacy uh, that it has in the world. Um, and then the last part, the tyranny of distance, well, that's being overcome with sort of new methods of state competition and warfare, like, you know, cyber and social media and um, the contestability of narratives and the fact that we all tend to live now in a single global community rather than in, in separate theatres. And I think that's really the challenge for Australia is to, to help to shore up each of these elements to the extent that we can, but also... Um, to rely a little more upon ourselves in, in doing so. We've been had the luxury for at least since the end of the Cold War of largely being able to rely on the United States to sort of set the running, and we've dealt with issues in our neighbourhood, um, but we haven't had to necessarily act very independently in the pursuit of our foreign policy aims. I think that is changing now, and we're seeing that in defence. Um, I think we're increasingly seeing it in our, in our foreign affairs and foreign diplomacy strategy as well. Speaking of difficult decisions and being far from competing theatres, um, one difficult decision that's been taken just in the past couple of weeks has been to withdraw from, uh, from the forever war in Afghanistan. And maybe that's time to reflect briefly on and looking back on that 20 years long engagement and the huge investment that Australia made in that engagement. Was that... How do you see that, Peter, looking back on it? Was it the right decision at the time and have we taken the right decision since? Well, a lot of criticism around our uh, engagement in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, the, the main criticism, I guess, is that um, Australian governments did so because and, and added our expeditionary forces, if you like, really for alliance management. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that's a bit um, sort of one-dimensional, that criticism. Um, and I think this goes back to the point I made about our lack of ambition. Um, there are a lot of uh, Australians, diplomats and others, who can make a positive contribution in world affairs, whether it's in the Middle East or elsewhere. I mean, Dave has experience in the Middle East, so do I. I, I think so. It's not just a matter of us following the US and, and, and doing that. I think if we had a different mindset, we could actually have a much more positive contribution. And look, the evidence is there that despite the strategic uh, problems with, uh, and the mistakes, I, I guess, but with both Iraq and Af Afghanistan, and one can make a very strong argument that they were strategically uh, problematic uh, for the West, there was a lot of good work done. You, know, the, the, uh, you can't take away from the fact that Australian forces, Australian personnel uh, did much good work in Afghanistan and Tarrant Kaut, um, building schools and, and, and hospitals and doing all the different things that they did to make a better life for the people in Afghanistan. And the, uh, the real fear now, is particularly for women in Afghanistan, is that the withdrawal of um, coalition forces uh, will mean a, a return to the Taliban. And there's no particular uh, agreement based on conditions with the Taliban because Trump basically <laughs> made a, a unilateral decision. Maybe Biden and the other uh, partners come to some sort of agreement on conditions for the withdrawal by September 11th, although I'm, I'm uncertain about that. There is a broader strategic uh, issue in that for Biden, and that is, and for us to a certain extent, is where are our big um, issues and challenges? And obviously, with Russian troops, f f you know, forming up at the border with Ukraine, with the issues around Taiwan, the South China Sea, uh, and China with the Uyghurs, and and Hong Kong with Myanmar. Um, obviously, the Biden administration is looking to to refocus its attention on the areas where. Uh, it can actually uh, make a real difference. And Afghanistan has a domestic element as well, and the withdrawal of troops is quite, um, I think, popular domestically, politically in the US. Um, so for us, I think the work that we did in Afghanistan and Iraq is of great value. Um, you can debate the strategic 
uh, errors that that were that motivated our engagement, but you can never debate the fact that we actually made a real contribution to people's lives. And I know that I was in Iraq for a year. As far as just very quickly, sorry, I know I've got to be brief and, and let Dave talk about this, but the, the, the transition to Afghan national forces is really going to be, um, the success of that is going to be dependent really on whether they have actually trained up those forces to a stage where they can actually keep Afghanistan together or will the Taliban pretty much roll over them. It didn't quite happen in Iraq. Iraqi security forces have sort of maintained um, some level of a, of a state, if you like, and a government that's been uh, democratically elected. I'm not so confident about Afghanistan. What's our legacy there, Dave, now? I think it's a, it's a positive legacy. I mean, look, firstly, and the main reason we went in there, Afghanistan is no longer a net exporter of insecurity and no longer a safe haven for um, terrorist groups in the way it was, and that was, the, that was the, the cause, if you like, of the United States and its allies going in after September the 11th. So it's no longer an exporter of security problems to the world. Civil society exists now in Afghanistan where it didn't before. Um, women and young girls have access to education. Uh, there's, um, you know, a degree of freedom that didn't exist before. Admittedly, this is more concentrated in the major towns and urban centres, much less so in the rural areas. So I, I think, though, that we can look back and think we've left Afghanistan in a much better place than we came in. The big question, though, is how much of this will be enduring or can it endure and, and will the Afghan security forces and institutions be robust enough to hold up? And, look, we're just going to have to um, to wait and see. I mean, uh, I'm hopeful that they will. Um, if there are significant setbacks, I don't think we would want to rule out the possibility of, of going back in there. I mean, people, Peter mentioned Iraq. Iraq, we've been sort of um, sending people back in and pulling them out now for, for several years, but the Iraqi state has by and large held up quite well from a number of challenges. We, you know, we surged people in there to combat ISIS when it emerged, um, but it's now back standing on its, on its feet again. And I think in Afghanistan, we'll be in a similar situation probably over 10 or 15 years, depending on how the Taliban goes and how, how strong Afghan institutions are. But I think um, we've been there, look, 20 years. This is a pretty long campaign in Australian history. We've had about 39,000 Australians who've been through Afghanistan and served in Afghanistan, military and civilians. And, of course, we've lost 41 lives there. So I think um, with all that in mind, I think we can be proud of, of what we've achieved. You have both talked about um, the, the transition to the Biden administration, and that that's, this is one of... Um one of the Biden's first sort of Biden administration's first very significant moves. Um, the other one has been on climate change, and it's going to be a very big year for um, global responses to climate change. With the appointment of John Kerry as a climate envoy, was a pretty important signal that the United States was going to change course and take it seriously. It's an important year for a really November um, COP coming up. Lots of announcements on net zero by 2050, the European Union, China by 2060, Japan and South Korea. Everybody, every member of the uh, Paris Agreement is obliged to update those pledges prior to that meeting. Most of those have been on reaching net zero by 2050. And China's commitment has been ambitious and probably took um, many members by surprise. Australia now has Matthias Cormann in the position of Secretary General of the OECD and in the lead up to that vote, he pledged to help countries around the world reach global net zero emissions by 2050. And I'm, Peter, I'm wondering what you read into that um, commitment. What does that mean for Australia, given that this has been such an incredibly toxic debate, toxic politically, toxic um, for, the, for the, Australian, uh, the Australian government and the Australian people, really? Where does that leave Australia in, in the lead up to November. Well, again, it leaves Australia behind the eight ball. And, you know, Scott Morrison won't even commit to a, a hard target of net zero emissions by 2050. He says, oh, look, we'll, we'll, we hope to get there by 2050, which is very wishy-washy. Uh, we, 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 we're doing things to get there to, uh, by 2050. Um, you, you noted China's commitment. I wouldn't call it ambitious. They've said they'd get to net zero emissions by 2060, but there's no real evidence um, really on the ground of uh, what they're doing. Remember, China is responsible for some 28% of global emissions. Um, the US is about 15%. Australia is only 1.5%, but of course, if you include thermal coal exports into that, it, it goes up to about 5 or 6%. So we are a major emitter, uh, if you include that kind of statistic. We need to be doing more and working with other middle powers, as I said earlier, 
to get an agreement at COP26, if you do believe that climate change is an existential threat, if you do accept the scientific evidence, and I know there's a lot of debate about that, or not debate, a lot of conspiracy theories about that, and the, the breakdown and disruption of our public debate, if you like, you, you noted the toxicity of this. It, it has been successive Australian governments, including Labor governments, that have failed on this issue over the last uh, 10, 15 years. We have failed as a nation to get this right. Uh, it shouldn't have been this way. And then, I mean, uh, Dave can speak to some of the, the people on the sort of fringes of his party and, and his coalition who um, uh, uh, climate change deniers effectively and, and throwing about conspiracy theories on their Facebook pages and so on. But the serious business of actually getting to an agreement at COP26, it's encouraging that Bi um, uh, Biden's envoy, John Kerry, uh, has got some sort of agreement with China. In fact, this is a kind of a bright spot amongst a very rancorous, tense um, situation with China now that the US has, whether it's on the Uyghurs, on Tibet, on um, Hong Kong, on the South China Sea, on interference in our democratic process, on cyber attacks, all of these things are causing great tension between us, the US and China, as well as us and China. And we are caught in that too because of the, the economic interdependence that we have with China to an extent, the majority of our exports or the, the important uh, economic relationship we have. How do we navigate that? So I, I am very, very pleased to see that Kerry's achieved a breakthrough there, at least in a rhetorical sense, to get some sort of statement and agreement with his counterpart, Xi Jinping. I think I pronounced that correctly. But does that, is that going to translate into actual emissions reductions at COP26? Now, we should be actually playing a role in this. And this is another failure of the, of, of the Morrison government. There's a lot of, um, you know, reaction, reacting to events. And I, I've just got to say that we're going to throw the gloves off and I'll make this quick because now, Dave, you've got to get ready because I'm going to throw at this you. <laughs> Scott Morrison. Scott Morrison, it's amateur hour on foreign policy, your Prime Minister. You know, he, he, when he started off... He announced a move of Jerusalem, uh, our embassy to Jerusalem, to try and win, get you over the line in a by-election. Well, no, it is. I'll, I'll get to climate change. A general stop to, to, to get to uh, to get you over the line, it didn't work because most Jewish Australian voters in Wentworth saw right through it. Uh, then, tell then, then he, Minister Scott Morrison, then he, he called Donald Trump and tell him to step well, aside. You well, want speaking to talk of Donald Trump, the other big foreign policy. The other big mistake that your prime minister made was to sit, stand up on a, an election. Uh, rally with Donald Trump, breaking down what has been a long-standing uh, tradition and convention between Australian Labor and Liberal Prime Ministers and Republican Democrat Presidents not to intervene in, in our de uh, relative dom domestic politics. And then there was the inquiry uh, on, on COVID-19. Now, I supported an inquiry, Dave. I supported an inquiry actually a couple of weeks before Morrison said it. We should have a, a scientific inquiry. But the way Morrison executed that, he sort of ran out of the trenches into no man's land saying inquiry, 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 looked over his shoulder and there was no one following him. He didn't do the hard yards diplomatically. He didn't do the work with partners and with China to get a functional inquiry up, which was necessary globally for us to deal with the pandemic. So my charge on this, whether it's COP26 and the lack of ambition on climate change, whether it's these kind of amateur mistakes that are made in foreign policy, is that the, the Morrison government, the Liberal government for eight years, um, you know, I, I was critical of Malcolm Turnbull for being the Basil Fawlty of, of foreign affairs. You know, he's all over China one minute, next moment he's like, you know, talking tough and beating his chest. But Morrison is making mistake after mistake on foreign policy. Why? Because the sugar on the table, the domestic hit on a foreign policy issue is too irresistible for Mr Morrison. He's got to grab it. It was to get him up over the by-election. Thank God you won the next one. Well done. But your, your, your foreign policy, your government's foreign policy is actually doing us damage because it's not thinking strategically, it's not thinking about the long term and our place in the world. Okay, can, can I... well, well. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Go, Dave. Go, Dave. Look, this is... Um... <laughs> We're back to climate, by the way. I, I, yeah. I empathise with oppositions, right, because you need to... You don't actually have your hands on the levers of government. You need to make a criticism. But Peter has just given the classic example of an opposition, saying you, you throw out empty phrases like the government doesn't think strategically, they need to act more diplomatically, we need to be more ambitious. But tell me, what would you like to do differently? Peter says he supported an independent inquiry into the COVID-19 outbreak, but now... And Peter also argued that Australia should have a more ambitious, and Labor always talks about a more independent and creative middle power diplomacy. Well, here we are taking a lead on an issue, and Labor says, 
It's wrong to have done that. Peter, no, says, say that. Peter says that we should be more ambitious on climate change. We're yet to get a 2030 target from Labor. Would Labor like a different 2030 target? I'm all ears. Let's hear about it. I'm happy to answer those questions. On the first so I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh, keep Are there rhetorical Peter? questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, Peter, you've had your shot. Um, I, and now I'm going to get to the actual substance of the issue, which is, which is the question about climate change. Look, I think Australia, and I think this is um, Matthias Cormann's election to the OECD was interestingly... Um, I think, a good illustration of this fact. Australia has actually got a good record of achievement in this area. And if, if one of the complaints we have as a government, and I certainly do, is that this debate has been taken over far too much by symbolism and tokenism and rhetorical commitments that don't actually lead to any change in things. It, amongst OECD countries, um, the average reduction in emissions from 2005... 2005 is the baseline target for the Paris commitment. Average reduction in emissions across OECD countries is 9% from 2005 to 2020. In Australia, the emissions reduction in that same period is 19%. In countries like Canada and New Zealand, who are often held up as exemplars, including by Peter and his colleagues, of what Australia should be doing on climate change, do you know how much their emissions have reduced since 2005? By less than 1%. So this is the record we're talking about. We're actually achieving things in Australia. Now, I would like to see us be more ambitious. I would like to see us get to net zero emissions by 2050 um, at the latest. I'd like to see it preferably done earlier. But us just saying it isn't going to will it into existence. We don't live in a fairy tale land. We actually have to figure out how do we decarbonise sectors of the economy? How do we offset um, carbon-intensive sectors of the economy, like industrial processes, like agriculture? What are the technical solutions we're going to be able to develop and implement and commercialise at scale to allow this to happen. This is where the debate's going. And I think Matthias's election to the OECD, we were told by everyone on the centre-left here in Australia, including people in Peter's own party, that there's no way Matthias will be elected because he's a climate change denier. The OECD wants someone who will embrace this. Well, I think Matthias went round the European capitals and told each of them, as did the Prime Minister, what we've actually achieved on climate, what we're preparing to do, what we're planning to do, and how we believe that technology is actually going to provide a solution to a lot of these problems, and that's where we're investing our efforts. Um, and they bought it. I mean, Matthias, a non-European running the OECD is a pretty unusual thing. The fact that he was elected, I think, is a testament to how the rest of the world actually sees us, to the contra to, to in, in contradistinction to how Peter and his colleagues would like to think that people look at I, Australia. I, I love the, the fired-up Dave, not the diplomatic Dave, so I'm, I'm, I'm engaged. This is engaging... So most of what I heard there was Matthias Cormann, Matthias Cormann, Matthias Cormann. Are we going to hide behind the wizard of the OECD who's hiding behind a curtain? Look, where is your ambition about what your government has done, well, I'd say not done, over the last eight years? Maurice is MIA pain. We don't see her at all. Um, you're up here on the stage. Good on you, Dave. You're engaged in foreign affairs uh, and policy issues. But to answer some of your your sort of counter charges to me. Yes, we would do things very, very differently. First, we, we, we've already made a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, which your government has not made. There, where well, is the commitment? Where's the 2030 commitment, though? Because that's a valid question, Dave. Well, it is a valid question because we're not in government and we're actually doing so the calculations on, no on, mid, uh, on mid-term commitments. You need to actually run the numbers, mate. Like, we are... It's now, by the time that we get to the next elections, 2022, people? we are... 20, what are we, 2021? 2022, by the time we get to the next election, maybe there'll be an next election at the end of this year. And, and then the party can actually come out with... Uh, its calculations around any mid-term targets. But the commitment so is there for net zero emissions. And the commitment is also there, if you want to talk substance, around investment in renewable energy infrastructure, whereas the people in your party are still trying to dig out money uh, for more coal-fired power plants. I mean... The current, the yeah, there current are, commitment period, though, is to 2030. There is no... There is no binding international agreement to 2050. They're not, we're not talking about a mid-term target here. We're so that's your, your that's Paris your excuse not to have a commitment to no, net no, zero emissions. No, we're saying we've got one to Paris and a Paris emissions reduction target to 2030. Yeah, and you're the counting the Kyoto Protocol, protocol the credits, which was a bit dodgy, by the way. You're accounting, but anyway, I know well, you've knocked that back now. I, 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 I get okay, that. Okay, okay, okay. What we're waiting to hear, though, is a 2030 target from you. We will lots Ring the bell. Dini, back to your corners. Um, we have got a lot of cats there, and I yeah. really think we need to get to China. So this is an area where your two parties may, may be more aligned. Um, Australia's been in the freezer. You've both talked about um, the international investigation to the origins of coronavirus. You can have disagreements on how that started and who supported it or didn't. Um, but the result of that was uh, China imposing a series of trade embargoes on Australian exports, collectively worth roughly $25 billion. 
or about 1.3% of GDP, so it's very significant. An influential piece of commentary published uh, last week, actually, by our lead economist, Roland Raja, looking in depth at the actual impact of those in a macro sense on Australia's economy, being quite a lot less, um, in fact, than had been originally predicted. Um, the, the result of the, the year or so came at the end of a, a period of difficulty with China, foreign interference laws in 2018, the ban on Huawei on the same year based on national security risk, other foreign investment decisions. The question then is to both of you, does it matter that we're in the freezer? Um, what, what would you do differently? Um, it, it, does it, should we you know, reset relations with China? How could you do that? Should we, should we be doing it at all? Or do we just stay where we are, um, confident that our economy is going to stand up, um, that we're going to be able to, do, to diversify and divert our exports elsewhere and that the sky is not going to fall in? So I'm going to start with you, Peter. Well, look, I mean, this, th there's a lot of agreement between Dave and I. Um, just you know, take note of the, the previous five minutes. That's a bit of theatre. But there are certain things in foreign policy where, where there is some alignment and, and, and bipartisanship around the sort of core values or core issues. Um, we may disagree on execution on a lot of things. And, and on the China relationship, um, I mean, our main criticism has been the way that this government has stuffed it up. I, I, I kind of called out the Basil Fawlty of foreign affairs, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, who's, you know, one minute trying to buy satellites off China to, to be friendly and appease them. And initially, I think he was uh, he was OK with some of the 5G stuff and then changed his mind. And then uh, at other times, he was pounding his chest, trying to look tough. And my, and Morrison, to, to an extent, on this, when you, when you try and look tough for domestic political uh, purposes, that has... I have a real problem with that because you're sort of... You're, you're, you're kind of polluting... Uh, what are really important foreign policy objectives, national security objectives, by by appealing to to, to a certain demographic, if you like, for domestic reasons. Um, and with the China relationship, this is our our biggest challenge. And and look, I I, I mean, I, I, as an MP, I have spoken very very openly um, and in in a critical of China with respect to the Uyghurs. I know Dave has on human rights as well. Um, on Hong Kong, I was out there very, very early about what was happening there and, and in support of the democracy activists. Um, on the South China Sea, on the interference and the cyber uh, elements of what they're doing to interfere in our system, um, very, very forcefully and very strongly. We need to stand up on this. And I think um, we, we can maintain a very beneficial economic relationship with China, but we have a huge challenge uh, going into the next decade on how we balance this out. And with America, as some people might argue that they're not in decline, Biden's trying to arrest that in, at the moment. Our main strategic and security partner um, having its major difficulties, if you like, geostrategic difficulties, we're in a much more volatile world. world. But any government, whether it's Liberal or Labor, um, the success of Australia, our ability to maintain our prosperity, our security and the stability that we've all enjoyed as a trading nation is going to be almost wholly or entirely dependent upon how well we manage the relationship with both China and the US. Now, my argument is, and I think uh, Dave alluded to this a little bit earlier, as a middle power, we should be, I call it a fulcrum because a fulcrum is the, you know, Latin for the leg of a chair, it props up. You know, middle powers need to be working much more effectively together, not just in the one-dimensional quad, by the way, I think in a much more dynamic way to prop up the, the parts of the rules-based order that has served us so well, especially as a trading nation, as a, as a liberal democracy, and other nations in Southeast Asia and the region. We need to be working much more effectively together with Japan and South Korea and many other nations, Indonesia and so on, to prop that up. Because... Both China and the US, certainly under Trump, were, were pulling away from that rules-based order in different ways, whether it was on trade or security or, or in other areas. So it's up to us now to look after our interests going forward. And when we talk about independent foreign policy, well, we're on a bit more on our own now. We really have to stump up and, and step up to the plate. And that requires a degree of vision, imagination, creativity, ambition which I, I don't think this government has. If, if you know, Scott Morrison's making basic amateur mistakes like he has been, he may learn. John Howard did. I hope he does for our national interest. But that is the challenge with China. We need to actually be able to work with the other countries in the region to stand up and draw some of those lines. And that's going to be very, very difficult for us. 
Um, but I, and I don't see it right now happening with this government because it's too much focus on domestic point scoring. Are we stepping up um, in relation to China? You, um, Peter's talked about the quad and that's, it's not just an empty gesture. No, look, I think there's an, a number of initiatives we've got underway. An expanded well, a, a leaders level quad meeting is, is part, of, um, part of the mechanisms we're like using, if you like, to shore up the rules-based order and um, promote stability and security in the Asia-Pacific. Um, we've got increasingly a sort of a, a G7 plus three grouping that's underway, which is the G7 countries plus um, uh, Australia, Korea and India that are convening, uh, which is sort of like almost a Western democracies type forum. We've got Five Eyes interactions happening, not just at the intelligence level, but now the foreign defence and, and treasury ministers. Th these are all designed to basically to maintain the open rules-based order um, in our region. I think on, on China, I mean, there's a, a couple of points to note here, I think. You talked about a, a reset, Alex. I don't think there's a simple reset on offer. I know that's... that's um, you know, intuitively attractive to people that we just need to push a button and, um, you know, um, f forgive the ill temper and the bad words and things like that. But there are more structural things going on here. This isn't just about some harsh words exchanged you know, on an evening, you know, or a kind of a, a discussion that went off the rails or something like that. And I think when you saw um, the Chinese embassy in Canberra um, provide to Fairfax and other media commentaries this sort of list of 14 demands, if you like, about what Australia needed to do to get the relationship back on track. Well, these aren't these aren't sort of cosmetic things. These go to the heart of Australia's um, system of governments, our parliamentary democracy, our freedom of expression, and any number of things. These are non-negotiable um, sovereign values and interests. They, they go to the heart of how Australia runs and works, and, and they aren't going to be negotiated or, or traded away. Um, I think, though, that... Ultimately, I mean, I have some faith that the relationship will find a new equilibrium, if you like. Um, firstly, China's not going anywhere. Um, the, um, the, the CCP, the rulers of China, aren't going anywhere. Um, and Australia's not going anywhere. We're going to live in the same neighbourhood. It's inevitable that we are going to interact and trade. Australia's got a huge Chinese community and Chinese-Australian diaspora here, um, which strengthens those links. But it's natural that we will, we will trade and interact. And ultimately, the reason that nations interact is because it's in their mutual interest to do so. I mean, there's not much sentimentality in foreign affairs and foreign relations. There's a degree of it. We talk about shared history and shared values, but generally speaking, I'm a bit of a realist like this. And the reason that Australia and China have had such a successful economic relationship over um, three decades now is because we've got hugely complementary economies. Um, they've, we've got things that they wish to buy and we've got, um, they've got things that we wish to buy. We, we've got a country they'd like to visit. We've got a, they've got a country we'd like to do business with. And these sort of realities are going to reassert themselves. And you pointed to the research that the Lowy Institute has done. I mean, the mainstays of the trade, which are really in the resources end of things, it's um, iron or coal and, and gold by and large. I mean, the macro level of the trade is, is holding up remarkably well. We saw a bigger loss in trade volumes to the rest of the world last year through the pandemic than we did um, to China. Um, and I think that that's because um, we want to interact. My view is that with a bit of patience and... Um, Consistency in this relationship, things will uh, resume in new normal. I mean, we're already seeing China turn its fire on the United Kingdom. That's become the public enemy of the day, um, you know, for what they've, the, the things they seem to have done. And the way that China has tended to work diplomatically is it tends to, tends to try and focus on countries bilaterally where it can bring its full weight of its diplomatic and economic muscle to bear and to cower them. Sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it doesn't, and it moves on to the next country. And where groupings like the Quad... Um, and the G7 plus three and, um, and other groupings are so important is they provide some solidarity between these countries and they, uh, they um, try and ensure that countries aren't getting picked off against one another. And I think that's why these sorts of new and novel groupings, which may or may not be institutionalised in a big way, are so important to navigating the period ahead. Can I just make two points about that? I mean, I agree with much of what Dave said, but the, the real question, and I sort of alluded to it earlier, is that where do you, where, where will Australia draw that line, whether it comes to human rights or those core values that Dave mentioned, you know, freedom of expression, rule of law, um, and, and all of the things that we hold dear and think are fundamentally important to us as a democracy? That's a really important question. That's a tough one because uh, it'll come up against that realism that, that, that Dave's talking about. And I, I'm all for realism, but at a certain point, strategic realism becomes... Uh, somewhat of strategic cowardice because we're not prepared to stand up 
um, and 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 really defend those things that that Dave those principles that Dave uh, articulated. And for us, we don't know where that line is. Now, Dave and I are on, on the treaties committee. He's the chair, I'm the deputy chair. We look at FTAs, you know, whether it was with Hong Kong, um, we look at, you know, free trade agreements with all sorts of different treaties, you know, and the, the human rights issues, remember the Hong Kong protests were happening right when we were looking at that sort of uh, Hong Kong FTA, Australia, Hong, Hong Kong FTA. And I came out, and I think Dave did as well, but I, I said Australia should reconsider this, it's symbolic, but they should reconsider this in the, in the context of what is happening to those democracy, you know, the protesters in the streets of Hong Kong. Um, at what point are we going to draw the line? Um, and obviously there's a, a price to pay, you know, our economic um, interests will take a pounding. They already have, in a sense, with, uh, I know Dave's right, there has been some increase in exports and so on, despite the kind of freezer narrative, that, that, that's certainly true, and, and Lowy's done a lot of good research on that, which we can draw from, but, but it's also true that they have tried to bully us on uh, trade issues to try, as, as Dave said, cow, to try and get countries to cower. Now, we haven't kind of buckled uh, under that, but there is this obvious question about where we draw the line on, on some of these really critical issues, whether it's interference, cyber security, human rights, and all of the values that we think are important within that, and I say liberal rules-based order, because it's not just a rule, you can have any rules-based order. China can have its own rules-based order that we all got to follow, it's arbitrary. But we believe in a liberal rules-based order, so there's certain principles to that, like <laughs> the rule of law, the normative uh, framework for international law. There, there's got to be some sort of framework that, that is part of that liberal rules-based order, and we need to be able to defend that, and we need to do it with our partners in the region. Now, I'm going to sort of say very quickly, um, Dave, and I'm sure we'll get to talk more about this in Q&A because I do want to go to the audience, but did you want to say something about drawing some lines? Because Australia has certainly drawn some lines in the past couple of years. Yeah, look, I guess I'd, I'd draw a distinction between our own system and values in Australia, which are non-negotiable. So this is, you know, parliamentary democracy, freedom of expression. Obviously, those things are not things we're going to trade away with China. I think what Peter's touching on here, though, is things in, in China, human rights situation in um, amongst the Uyghurs and in Hong Kong and whatnot. And I'm always in favour of us speaking out on those things, but generally speaking, I'm, I'm resistant to sort of tie formal diplomatic and trade relations to those things. I generally think that how another country runs itself um, is certainly a, a matter for legitimate public interest in Australia, but ultimately it's, it's their decision. And that is at the heart of the you know, sovereign equality of nations, if you like, and respect for different systems of government. And I think if, if we think that we're going to change um, China's behaviour towards its own people through castigation or ostracisation or criticism, I think we're deeply mistaken. I mean, this is coming up in the context of the Beijing Winter Olympics, where some people are saying we should boycott um, the Winter Olympics uh, to, to, uh, to make a point about our criticism of China's human rights um, treatment of its own minorities. I think we should absolutely be critical of that treatment, but I think boycotting the um, Winter Olympics would actually have the opposite effect to that. Yeah, you gonna, Can I just ask you, well, you wouldn't maintain that restraint when it comes to the creation of artificial islands in the South China Sea because now we're seeing a breach of international normative, norms, uh, international law. So I assume you are drawing a line when it comes to international law with respect to China digging up some sand and pretending their islands are double the size that they are. Look, I think... I, I mean, I think it's a different... This is sort of not, not a China internal matter now. This is a, a matter that yeah. goes to the heart of the, the global commons. So, yes, I would take a position. But, look, on that issue, I mean, look, that's a... We, we've, we've failed to combat that. We collectively, you know, the Western Alliance system, because we allowed it to happen piece by piece. Um, we Rain took assurances um, at face value, you know, President Xi assured President Obama that there was no intent to militarise the South China Sea. Um, we let them get on with the land reclamation activities. Um, and lo and behold, you know, they've constructed aircraft hangars and missile silos on there. So it's... Tracks on the ground. Yeah, very difficult thing to deal with. Um, now, we do have almost 20 minutes for question and answer uh, session, so please raise your hand. Don't forget to identify yourself um, if you've got a question, and I'll try and take as many questions as I can in the next 15, 20 minutes. Gentleman up here at the front. There's a microphone that'll come to you. Armin, Armin Hicks, I'd just like to go to one specific international rule, and that would be R2P. Um, is this a global norm or is this parrot now dead and we should just abandon it? I, I don't think it should be dead. Um, and in fact, in the context of Myanmar, very early in February, I called for a number of things to occur, the suspension of the military agreement, 
uh, visa amnesty, as Alex mentioned, for students in Myanmar and Australia, a, 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 a companies to cease doing business in Myanmar, and also um, a recognition of the CRPH, a legitimate representative body for the elected leaders. And then R2P has to come into this. Like, at what point, and this goes to what we were talking about earlier, what point will Western democracies say, hold on, the rise of authoritarian military regimes needs to be checked? Now, I get what Dave's saying about sovereignty and the Westphalian system and all this kind of orthodoxy, great. But we are in a world now where rising military, authoritarian and autocratic states are winning and they're beating us up. Uh, and and uh, Myanmar is an example of a nascent democracy just emerging and the coup that occurred. What is the West doing about this? What is, I mean, Biden's first statements were encouraging. Australia was pathetic. Like we actually had our number two, our VCDF actually call their number two, which was a huge propaganda win for, for the, jun the junta. Um, and we've been very slow. Maurice Payne did eventually cancel, or the defence did cancel the military cooperation agreement. But what is the West going to do? Are, are we going to be assisting some of the, uh, the armed resistance groups? And I'm talking about the, you know, the, the different ethnic groups who are now uh, rising up against the junta. Or are we just going to say, you know what? These guys are going to win. Let's just, just, just sit, sit back and watch them shoot people in the head in the street. It's a big question. Dave, is that what you're doing? No, not at all. But I think it's look. It's it's very easy to say what are we doing, and and these military regimes are winning. But the the obvious for is well, what do you propose to do about it? I just it? gave you four things. No, but I mean, is the that government's actually gonna, done one of them? That's that's not going to change. Yes, that's it not going to change the trajectory in Myanmar. I mean, it's very easy to oh. engage in these gesture politics where you say gesture. we're going to condemn these people and <laughs> we're going to suspend this. Sorry, if you actually think that's ultimately, if you're saying you're going to stand by the responsibility to protect, ultimately where that leads to, do you is think diplomacy armed, is, is gesture is armed, politics? Is armed intervention. Either you, you, you stick by the right. principle and say well, we're going all the way with here's this. Here's where we disagree. On, on here's where we disagree. Peter, please yeah, let on. me finish because I gave you a good shot at this. Um, I think with the responsibility to protect, um, I think it marked the high water mark, if you like, of a kind of a, an idealist strain in international affairs. It is never going, never had at the time. Um, and we'll never have subsequently the international muscle you need to enforce it. And I think doctrines like this are dangerous if you're never prepared to back them up. Um, there was one sort of rather futile attempt in Libya, which probably discredited the doctrine for all time. Um, it didn't leave Libya in a great uh, situation. It stopped the immediate threat that Gaddafi uh, posed to um, some of his fellow countrymen. But once Gaddafi was gone, the West got out because no one was interested in engaging in this sort of patient nation building exercise. Now, this isn't an argument for doing nothing as, um, as Peter is seeking to characterise my position, but it does mean that let's not throw out principles there and expectations and say that we're going to be with you to the end and we're going to fight to the last person in Australia and the last dollar to do this when clearly we're not and public support wouldn't be there and taxpayers wouldn't be there. Let's be modest in our aims and let's be effective in what we're seeking to do. That's what I'm arguing for. Well, I, can I just, 20 seconds, Alex? The, this is where we disagree. 20 seconds. Uh, set aside R2P for the moment. I'm only talking about modest aims of recognition, like the United Nations has, of the CRPH, uh, a visa amnesty, things that you, support you, you, the legitimised, not legitimising, rather than at least do nothing. Don't legitimise the military junta, which is basically what your government did. But at least don't the do that. Was about RTP, and if we not are, about a, hold on, I, 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 let me finish the ten seconds I got left. We can actually do some. We can do things collectively with multiple countries to put pressure on the junta to let them know that they are not the legitimate government of Myanmar. And that is important, in my view, for liberal democracies to be participating in the countries in the region, but more broadly, all democracies need to be standing up collectively and putting pressure on this junta and saying, you are not the legitimate government of Myanmar, and we don't accept that. And we've done the opposite to that. Oh, so I, I mean, I'm going to have to exercise a right of play. I don't disagree with some of Peter's prescriptions on Myanmar, um, but in fact, the government has spent a defence cooperation. We've got five of the Tatmadaw sanctioned. Maurice Payne's had 20 phone calls with her counterparts. The Prime Minister's raises the quad level meeting. I'm saying let's be uh, realistic about what we can achieve. Peter's response to your initial question was about RTP and military regimes on the rise around the world and what is the West going to do about this? And I'm saying let's not overreach here and about what we're going to be able to do to stop that. A lot of these countries, they're going to end up determining their own fate, much as we might wish it to be otherwise. Uh, Richard McGregor at the back there. Richard McGregor is our senior fellow on China. Uh, is that on? Yeah. So both of you have worked in national security here and abroad. 
I want to ask you a question about how we got to where we are on China. If you listen to people like Paul Keating, some of your former colleagues, like the former ambassador to China, mm. they say the intelligence agencies have taken over policy and are leading policy. And I guess the inference to be drawn from that, that it's sort of manipulation of information and covertly doing the bidding of the United States. What's your response to that sort of narrative that the intelligence agencies are really running China policy? I'm going to go to you, Dave, first. Yeah, look, I mean, I've, I've heard that criticism and I'm always, um, you know, I'm always alive to alternative theories, if you like, or, you know, I'm, I think these things should be scrutinised and it's a legitimate point for them to make. If I looked at what's changed in our relationship with China over 20 years, say, um, it's fundamentally China has changed. It's gone from being firstly an economy that was about 4% of global GDP in the year 2000 to about 18% today. It's a much bigger country. Um, it's a much more um, ambitious country for itself, as you'd expect. A country gets to be that size, it starts to demand a bigger say um, in the affairs of the world. Um, and it's a much more um, centralised political system now uh, under Xi than it was when you had... Pre prior to Xi, you had a sort of a loose collective leadership model operating. Now you've got power much more centralised under one figure who doesn't seem to have much in the way of internal scrutiny and checks and balances um, and doesn't seem to have uh, term limits. And all that has led to a China that is behaving in a way that is, is, is more ambitious, uh, more aggressive um, and more sort of uh, mindful of its own sovereign interests. And that's really why this relationship is becoming harder to manage, not because the intelligence agencies have seized control of the narrative. It's because China is challenging us, or the state of China is challenging us, in a whole range of areas where it simply didn't do it 20 years ago. Cyber, um, our political system, any number of things internationally. And, and Dave, I agree with a lot of what Dave's saying. Richard, you've written about this, obviously, in your, your book, The Rise of Xi Jinping, so you know about that centralisation more than anyone in this room, I think, and um, clearly the changes have been significant. Um, all I can say, all I can add to what, what Dave said is that th this has changed in a huge way over the last 10 years. I remember 12 years ago when I was working for Rudd how different the relationship was and you know I remember going to the embassy to talk to the ambassador about us meeting with the Dalai Lama because they were upset about it and the foreign ministry the ambassador got up read a telegram from Beijing and his hand I noticed after a while his hands were shaking as he's reading this and going on about the Dalai Lama being a splitter and how could you meet with him and our sovereignty and he's shaking and I looked over and there was and I'm sure it was the intelligence official the Chinese intelligence official in the in the embassy staring at him, you know, so this guy's probably not meeting his KPIs and might be sent to re-education camps uh, when he gets back to Beijing. And then I tried to engage him and, and talk about it and he got up and started reading the same note again. And so we know who run, was running the show in the embassy then. I just tell you that little anecdote because the, the foreign ministry has probably improved in their people um, that they've got here now, although that press conference the other day was probably not a good example of uh, that point. But the the, um, the the our engagement with China has changed significantly um, over ten years, and it is largely to to do with the points that Dave has raised about the centralisation of power and Xi's concentration of power with Xi and, and the way they're operating and how much more aggressive they are. Now I've got too many questions. Um, I, uh, John Connor at the back asked a question earlier, and I might take two or three if that's all right with you, and we'll see if we can, in the last seven minutes, um, address them all. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just one, just, uh, and then yeah, John Consul General yeah, here. Yeah. Sorry, John. Um, just one quick question, really. Uh, just sitting here, I sort of wondered whether I was perhaps in Tahiti or Samoa. And the reason I felt that was because there wasn't a single mention of Indonesia. We have a country to our north with roughly the population of the US, approaching that of Western Europe which is going to be in the, one of the top seven economies in the world in the next, I don't know, 10 years or whatever, probably less. And yet, we can have a discussion on foreign policy, not a single reference, even though, coincidentally, it entered into an agreement a little off a week or so ago with Japan for defence equipment and technology, which, as far as I saw, got one reference in the Australian press, which was two little bits at the bottom of page nine of the Australian. Would you like to comment on that? Well, uh, can I just say... Uh, yes, I will, actually. Oh, sorry. Just, take up a few um, questions, I think. the front, Andrew. Doing so we've got of... Indonesia. Now, to be fair, um, 40 minutes of discussion isn't a, isn't a, long, a long time to, uh, to get right around the world, but uh, I agree with you. Obviously, Indonesia is our nearest, largest neighbour, exceptionally important. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm uh, Akiyama Saiko. I'm Consul General of Japan in Sydney. 
appreciate uh, the Australia's policy and collaboration with Japan, including the Quad framework uh, symbolized by uh, recent uh, Quad summit meeting. The, my question is about uh, the, the rule-based international order the, in the Indo-Pacific region. I think, uh, the, I, I think that the both of you really pointed out the importance of uh, Australia's uh, leadership and contribution in, in, in this area. But what are your, what your, your thinking about the priority agenda, including Indonesia or some other issues? How, to, how, how, how will Australia uh, promote a rule-based uh, international order? Thank you. OK, and there's one more question at the back here. I'd just like to hear some comments about uh, the Australia ASEAN relationship. I mean, there was, you know, obviously during the Turnbull era, there was a, uh, it was a summit. Um, it, you know, it strikes me that whether, whether you're talking about China or you're talking about really making a difference to what happens in Myanmar, those ASEAN countries are really the crucial swing vote. Indonesia, obviously, being a, a particularly important player, but only one of the players in ASEAN. And again, it's not something we hear a lot about. Um, uh, but I'd, I'd be interested in, you know, what more we uh, we should be doing with ASEAN. Okay, so we've got Indonesia, Indonesia and ASEAN, ASEAN generally, and uh, what is the priority for the for, for the Quad and the rules-based international order? So just. Uh, you could divide and conquer, um, or you could try and cover it all in the remaining four minutes. Or we could work together in a bipartisan fashion. All for that. At the end of this. Um, look, very, I'll, I'll be very quick. On Indonesia, absolutely right. We didn't get a chance to talk about it. But actually, Dave and I, again, on the Treaties Committee, we had the Indonesian Free Trade Agreement. We had a very much uh, a long um, inquiry and submissions into our relationship with Indonesia. And it, it's just so stark how... Australian business and the, and the focus of our sort of foreign policy, national security community, just, just sort of skipped over Indonesia. Everyone just leapfrogged and went straight to China because they thought the pot of gold, you know, was there at the end of the rainbow and they're starting to see that it's not quite the case anymore and ignored uh, Indonesia to a certain extent. What is it, 2% uh, two-way trade or something? It makes up about 2%. There was a stark statistic. I mean, there's a real failure, again, of us, and this is not just any side, both sides of politics, to really uh, imagine a better relationship with, with our northern neighbour, who, who are the largest democracy in the region, in the, in the world, 280 million people. Um, on ASEAN and um, Indonesia, yes, the, uh, there is a meeting, apparently an emergency meeting of ASEAN on the 24th of April. I understand that the military, the leader of the military junta um, is going to be addressing ASEAN. I know it's kind of split now in two, so the democratic countries uh, are, are pushing for more action, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, for more action against Myanmar, whereas the sort of more autocratic country, uh, regimes, if you like, uh, are, are resisting. Uh, so its effectiveness or its efficacy is, is kind of questionable. Although, and, and I'll segue very quickly into the international rules-based order, how to go about that. Yes, ASEAN's a part of that. All that multilateral architecture, um, I've written about this, sorry, uh, Michael and Alex at ASPE, but um, another think tank, about the need for us to actually not only build on the multilateral architecture that, it, that exists to make it more dynamic, but actually to uh, that fulcrum idea of the middle power to actually work at a number of levels um, with partners like Japan and South Korea and Indonesia. You could have trilaterals, other quads with different countries on different issues, all in the sense of trying to promote and prop up elements of that liberal rules-based order. It doesn't have to be static. It can't just be one quad. And in fact, you could include China and the US and some of them in different ways, depending on what the issues are that you're, or the challenges that you're trying to meet. There needs to be more dynamism uh, regionally, uh, and we need to show more leadership in that space to, to actually protect that liberal rules-based order. Okay. Um, look, I think you're right to raise uh, Indonesia. I mean, you know, we, I don't think there was any neglect on our part that it didn't come up, it just hadn't come up in questions. But I, and I don't particularly like ranking of relationships, but there's no doubt that Indonesia is one of Australia's most important relationships, has been for a number of decades and will be into the future. And it's a relationship of, you know, still in my mind a kind of under um, that's that's delivering less than its potential we've got a few relationships like that around the region India's another one um, where we sort of have have a need to work more um, and work more closely together um, I think on uh, ASEAN and, and Indonesia I mean look 
we have gone through a lot of steps in recent years to upgrade our relations with ASEAN. It started first with our admission to the East Asia Summit, um, or so signing the ASEAN Treaty of Amity and Cooperation uh, in 2004, I think, and then joining the East Asia Summit in 2005. And then uh, it was under a Labor government, to their credit, where the East Asia Summit was expanded to include the United States and became this um, you know, regional, bigger regional grouping. Um, I think <coughs> ASEAN countries bilaterally and as a regional institution are key. And, you're quite right to point out, I mean, on Myanmar, ultimately ASEAN will have to be in the lead role in resolving this. ASEAN and the immediate neighbours, um, India, uh, Bangladesh, China um, and the ASEAN states, because they're the countries with the most influence over Myanmar. Australia, much as we might think of ourselves, um, the generals don't sit awake at night thinking what's Australia going to do about Myanmar, but they're very worried exactly. about the countries on, on their borders. Um, on the rules-based international order, look, I think um, we are working more closely with countries often of quite different political systems who share our interests. I mean, Vietnam is a classic case. Um, Vietnam doesn't particularly share our views on Myanmar and what should happen there because they're an authoritarian political system themselves. But on things like freedom of navigation on the high seas, um, the settlement of territorial disputes by recourse to recognised judicial mechanisms, countries like um, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia and Singapore within ASEAN are, are real key, and the Philippines are, are real um, keys to that. Last point, and I think this is an important one. I mean. We talk about, and I think this is correct, the US-China relationship is really the driving dynamic in the global order today. And the rest of us, including in Australia, we, we have a role to play, but really the, the global weather is set by that relationship. <coughs> um, ultimately, where that relationship is going to... is really where the sort of gears hit the road, if you like, is in Southeast Asia. This is the region um, where... Um, the countries are more sort of open diplomatically to both countries, where the competition is likely to be the most intense, where China is most um, keen to kind of establish a hinterland strategically and economically, uh, to control its, um, you know, its security of supply routes and everything else. So Southeast Asia um, and the 10 countries of ASEAN are going to be really where a lot of this competition plays out, just as in the Cold War, and I'm not saying we're in another Cold War, but just as in the Cold War, it was Eastern Europe where the competition between the um, Western Alliance bloc and the Soviet Union played out by and large. You know, Germany and, 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 and Germany, Poland, um, Yugoslavia, those countries down the, down the Iron Curtain line. Southeast Asia is really going to be the sort of the, the, the theatre that's most in play, and that's why our relations and our influence there will be so important. I rue the fact that I haven't been able to get to everybody's questions, so I apologise. Um, and also that this has been a, a rapid, rapid fire, 55, 59 minutes with one left to go. Um, there were lots of questions I didn't get to ask, which I'm annoyed about. So we didn't talk much about COVID. We didn't talk about border closures of vaccines um, or about diplomatic deficit and how Australia should be funding, diplomacy, defence and aid. Um, and we didn't get to politics in Canberra, um, which I think is an important topic. And you, just I, saw you, a bit you of too would. <laughs> 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 All in good spirit. Um, but I hope that the two of you will come back and join us and I'd like to have a discussion with you um, about that, whether it's on one of our podcasts or another event. So I hope you'll come back. Um, it, it fulfilled our expectations of a battle. Um, it was a showdown, the gloves were off. Uh, you didn't pull any punches, but uh, you were remarkably gentlemanly um, towards each other. Very good sport, so thank you very much. Um, thank you to the audience for your good questions um, and for your patience. We've got um, some events coming up um, next week. Uh, executive Director, who's here in the front row, is interviewing Michelle Flournoy, who is the former Under Secretary of Defence under President Obama, a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defence for Strategy in the Clinton administration and, uh, and the founder of the uh, Centre for a New American Security. Um, and she will be talking with uh, Dr Phil Love on our um, Director's Chair podcast later this week. Um, one of our research fellows, Alex Dayon, is interviewing David Malpass, the President of the World Bank, in a podcast for next week. So please tune in to those. Um, we look forward to seeing much more of you here at the Lowen Student in Bly Street um, throughout the rest of 2021. Thank you again and thank, thank you, you to our guests. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Thanks, David.